Hello and welcome to the Oxygen Addict Triathlon Podcast. We're brought to you every week by our sponsors, PrecisionHydration.com. Precision Hydration offer electrolyte drinks in different strengths to match how you sweat. Personalize your hydration strategy today at PrecisionHydration.com and get a free box or tube of Precision Hydration worth up to nine ninety nine using the code Oxygen Addict. We're also brought to you courtesy of our patrons who support the show with a monthly donation you can get our 2018 patrons only podcast as a thank you all right and welcome to the show hells how are you doing i believe you've had a successful weekend of racing my friend well we had a we had a good weekend of training rob yes we went out on a big big hilly bike ride um on saturday which was great preparation we did five hours and we did a few climbs including winnett's pass in the peak district and a number of climbs to get there and yeah perfect preparation for doing a sprint triathlon on sunday so yeah (laughs) do as do as we don't do do as we say or something right yeah, correct. Good, I think correct. good for you, mate. Good for you getting the training in that you need to do for your big ride in a month and also getting out and racing and having some fun as well. It just goes to show you don't always have to take things too seriously. You can pile in and have a race after putting in a solid day in the saddle. Well, I gave it a go. I was really a little bit worried about how my legs would be because, you know, bit, the other week toasty on the run. It was a little bit toasty. I just oh, I just didn't feel it did not feel good on the run. I had a stitch, Rob. I know I don't I don't ever get stitches on the run. I'm yeah, just you were always tired, this... mate, weren't you? Oh. Body's tired, that's what it is. I think my body was just like, All right, stop now. Where yeah. where is the finish line? You can you can stop right now. <laughs> um but yeah, it was funny. On the bike ride, Rob, I was with six other guys and uh I was being dropped quite a bit. They had to wait quite a bit for me, uh now and again. Uh, apart from one of the hills, I wasn't I wasn't slowest up the hill, so that was that was quite nice. But um, so anyway. this is your big ride. This isn't the race. You weren't. No, no, no. Through. Yeah, Sorry. got you. This, this is very much on the. This is on the the big the big chunky ride, and um, it was just knowing that at the end you could see one or two of them sort of saying, you know, I'm a little bit broken. I was thinking, oh God, yeah, I'm a little bit broken, and I've got this sodding race to do tomorrow. <laughs> but um you know um you know two weeks ago i actually went and did another big ride in preparation for the um panic training ahead of the coast to coast yeah (laughs) this is all what it's about and um so we did that big ride on the monday i think the sunday sunday whatever monday and then on the tuesday i did this local five mile run did had we recorded by then no podcast no we hadn't god that that was <laughs> dreadful that was just <laughs> utterly smashed legs and trying to race yeah that really was horrendous so i was quite surprised on sunday this week doing the sprint triathlon that yeah okay i didn't feel great on the run but it, it wasn't as horrendous as two weeks ago when i was just like i really wish i wasn't doing this <laughs> it'd be good for you i think to get out and do some slightly different stuff and just race for the fun of it and yeah be good good yeah. for you good fun i know i did realize though rob the other thing i did realize this week is that um i'm really not superhuman i think we all like to think we're a little bit superhuman don't we so i have made the sensible decision to not do my favorite race in the whole wide world ahead of an olympic distance triathlon the next day <laughs> what race would that have been so it would have been the Winkle Trout Run, the God, 90k yeah. cell run, which I yeah. love. But I was like, no, I want to go and enjoy the triathlon. So don't go and do the fell run. So there That'd we go. Be best I've, to not I'm do those two giving my back. place up. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it. Anyway, Rob, shut up, Helen. How are you? I'm a little bit broken too. I came off my bike today, believe it or no, not. No. It's my own, my own stupid fault. And here's a word of warning for everybody. Changed over the uh the garmin power pedals to the other bike and put the old cheapo pedals on the road bike and set off in the sun for a ride on the road bike hadn't tightened the pedals up didn't even notice so 20 yards down the road i stood up to sort of accelerate right pedal comes off the bike completely yahoo's onto the crossbar swung across the road desperately trying not to it was a comedy low speed crash basically bounced off a car postman was stood opposite me laughing his socks off 
<laughs> I'm on the ground, trying not to yell the F word at the top of my voice and failing miserably. So I'm all, I'm all banged up down one side. <laughs> oh no, so you bruised? Yeah, bruised and a bit sliced up. I managed to managed to bounce off my own chain rings. And you can imagine, can't you, if your foot kind of comes off at high, high, not high power, what's the word, like high torque, shin down the... Yeah, shin down the um the chain ring and that's all sliced and yeah, a bit of a mess. But it's all good. Oh, oh, Rob. Yeah, I'm in a lot better shape than my my mother-in-law who um I was meant to be racing slate man, you know, as you yeah. know this weekend and um I got the call at half past ten the night before as I was tucked up in bed ready to go to sleep that bless her she'd been watching the uh the royal wedding, the wedding. The sun all day stood up passed out fell face first into the concrete and got carted to any oh, so no. yeah so i was on i was on daddy daycare instead of racing so sorry to everybody who was up at slate man i was really looking forward to racing with you um thanks for the messages i got asking where i was <laughs> oh rob that's such a shame like for her clearly yeah yeah, yeah. And, and for me <laughs> Is she okay? She seems to be doing all right, yeah. She's back at home now. Okay. Uh, yeah. Oh, do you have a plan B for a race? I don't really, to be honest. I was looking I quite fancy going to do the Lakesman Half, but it's full. Oh. So, so if anyone knows anyone who might, you know, be able to get you in there, that might be nice. <laughs> yeah, that would be cool, wouldn't it, actually? Yeah, that would yeah, be quite I'd, nice. I'd like to... I'd like to get out and do something. I'm just going to go and tear up and down the local dual carriageway in the TT bike, I think, and get the frustration out that way. Okay, fine. Um, yeah, good. Anyway, we should say, big news of today. Today's interview of the week is with, well, we've got two interviews of the week, haven't we? We do. We have Richard Murray and Rachel Clammer on, Rob. Um, hilarious. Very, very funny. So, yes, you will definitely enjoy that one. Richard is uh, has a good, very good sense of humour. In fact, they it's both a funny do. interview, yeah. Yeah, so you will enjoy that one. Um, yeah, I, I Rachel didn't finish in Yokohama, unfortunately. She's a DNF, um, but she she won, didn't she? Her first WTS uh, race this earlier this year in March. She won in Abu Dhabi. Yeah. So it's yeah. So she's had a, a good, you know, brilliant race for her there and then Richard he has so much to talk about from Super League duathlon Olympics loads of stuff what happened in Hamburg a couple of years ago yeah Learning so it's a really good swim yeah it's a good interview Hells. yeah so that'll be fun so listen out for that one um meanwhile Rob there was a lot of racing going on there was results this week brought to us by our sponsors Precision Hydration now Obviously, if you've been a long time listener of the show, you're going to have heard our spiel for them before. But we love Precision Hydration. They are the guys who make what I consider to be the best um, hydration salts on the market. They have saved my life on numerous occasions. If you're someone who sweats a lot or you're somebody who is a heavy sweater in particular, or in fact, anybody in the kind of weather we've been having recently when it's hot, we need you to be getting some hydration salts inside you. Hydration is not just about getting fluid in. It's about getting the right balance of electrolytes in as well. And precision hydration make it really easy by having four different strengths of sachet. So you can match it up to how you sweat. They've got an online sweat test you can do that will guide you to which one to take. They've got an in-person sweat test that you can do if you want to go and see them in person and have it actually tested. And the thing that's interesting this week, Hells, I've seen one of their blog posts that they've put up there. Um, They've had a paper published in the British Medical Journal. Um, they teamed up with two prominent doctors from the US to explore the causes of hyponatremia in endurance events. So hyponatremia being basically excessively low sodium concentrations, which is what I've suffered from in all the long races that I've done, especially in the heat. Um, so, yeah, it's a really interesting article. Um, the guys who've written it, I'm not sure who it is. I think it's Andy has written it. It's done a really good job of taking you know, your sort of traditional scientific paper and putting it into words that even I can understand and showing how, although people used to think that hyponatremia was mainly down to people drinking far too much in the heat, what they think now is it may be largely down to people who sweat either excessively or have very high sodium concentrations in the sweat. So they're losing loads of sodium and they're also drinking. So it's it's not just down to people drinking too much when the heart, like those classic stories from the London Marathon, it's largely down to um, 
undiagnosed high sweat rates or high sodium concentration rates. So yeah, dead interesting read. So hats off to them basically for, for mixing it with the scientists, I reckon. Absolutely. And if you go on precisionhydration.com and on forward slash blogs, then you will find the piece on there about the paper published in the BMJ. And it is, Rob, it's a really, really, really interesting read and how it all came about and the sort of um, the doctors that, that they've been meeting with and working with and talking with. So, yeah, fantastic. So head over precisionhydration.com forward slash blogs and you will see it there. Um, cracking stuff. Rob, they're such good guys, aren't they? They are. And remember, you can get a free box or tube of pH worth up to nine ninety nine using the code Oxygen Addict. Love it. Rob, Love can it. I tell you one thing before we move into the uh, You were rocking results. the Precision Hydration Advisor, weren't you, at your race at the weekend at Wilms? Oh, I saw that on the... Absolutely. I did what all good people do. On the finishing do. podium. Yeah, which was, um, took my glasses off because I thought I looked like such a geek in my glasses sometimes. Put the visor on. <laughs> <laughs> You know, when they do the Tour de France finishes and um, they all do up their jersey and, you know, make sure or, or Roger Federer always makes sure that he's got the right watch on. You've when... got to look good on the podium. I was there like, well, I am absolutely I am absolutely sticking that visor on because a photo will be taken and I'm <laughs> going to be seen in precision hydration. So there we go. Uh, You're I would on like point, say, Helen. That's what the cool mom point. trying to say. You're on point. I was on point at the Wilmslow Sprint Triathlon with um, third place. Rob, I wanted to say that John Brunt got in touch with us, listener of the show, and he said, well, I'm not for blowing my own trumpet, but Chrissy Wellington, OA Tri Podcast, Precision Hydration, he was including us in a post here, I completed my first triathlon and a standard race. These guys got me through it. Chrissy's book, Great tips, down to earth, everything worked. The podcast kept me going when I was injured. So there oh, yeah. we go. Congratulations to John Brunt. Yeah, well done, John. Thanks for the shout out. We appreciate it, man. Right then, where should we start? We should let's kick off with the international races and then go local hells. Let's kick it off with seventy point three Barcelona this week. Um and I've got to say Oh man, Javier Gomez is looking pretty toasty this time of year, isn't he? He's looking pretty good, Rob, as he warms up for his Ironman debut in Cairns yeah. very soon. So yes, he took the win there, didn't he? A nice swift 110 run, a 225 bike and a 22 minute swim. I saw him beat David McNamee by about three minutes. David ran a 112, so again, nice and rapid. And Bart Renault was third. Adam Bowden as well got the fastest run of the day, Rob, with a 110.05. Um, to... That's insane, he, he... isn't it? It's good, isn't it? He, he fell back a little bit, I think, on the bike, but then managed to pick off a few places again once he got onto the run. So, yeah, win there. Nice one for Javier Gomez. And then Emma Pallant, Rob, she defended her title out in Barcelona. A nice swift 120-50 run to finish That's things impressive. off. And then another person who we need to give another shout out to for, what is that, two two weeks? Two and two, two, isn't it? Yeah. Two and two for another podium is Fenella Language. And um, yeah, great stuff. So newbie pro, as we've said, and she finished in 439 so second to emma palance 432 and it must have been pretty close so so she just held on there rob to second because eva vuti was third 25 seconds later but what a great result there for fenella and um i think we're gonna get her on rob over the next few weeks i've been in touch already yeah i noticed that that's gonna be good i think um she's real talent isn't she fast fast yes. swimmer and yeah. um and a strong biker as well so I think when a run picks up, it's only got to pick up a little bit to be really challenging for, for the top podium. But to be beating Eva Wooty, that's... And Camilla Pedersen as well. I hadn't noticed that name there, actually. All Fair of them. play, yeah. Nice right, work, Fenella. Get her on, yes. Hells. We're, honestly, we are on it. We have been in touch. We've made contact. We have mentioned that we could talk about cake and other things. So, yeah, we will look forward to that. Rob, over in Chattanooga in the US. <laughs> say that again. Say that again. <laughs> yeah, I did say Chattanooga. Chattanooga. Uh, Chattanooga. Yeah, Chattanooga. That's how we Heather say Jackson. it in Northern England. <laughs> Heather Jackson, Rob, and uh, and Starkovich took the wins there. And Heather Jackson 
only just finished just ahead, didn't she, of uh, Meredith Kessler, who she is. She is racing, racing at the moment, isn't she? Yeah. It's amazing stuff. Yeah. And then uh, Lindsay the Corbin between. was third. I could see Andy Starkowitz take a win as well. Um, two hours flat and 40 seconds on the bike. And then a 122 run. So enough for him to just hold on this time. I love it when he races. He's going to... He wasn't at Kona this year, was he? I don't think... He I wasn't don't... at Kona this year, so I'd, I hope he gets out to Kona again this year because I think he he lights the bike up when he does, you know, really changes the dynamic of the race when people have got to chase these massive leads down. Whereas mm. if you get him and Cam Worth together on the bike, it'll really change the dynamic. <laughs> I love it. And your uh, favourite named Canadian, Rob? Yeah, Jackson Laundry. <laughs> yeah, second place. Good stuff. All right, so next up in the old results, we are going to jump down to the Outlaw Half in Nottingham. So for international listeners, uh, the Outlaw run a series of races in the UK. Uh, They're all branded together. There's a couple of half-distance races and a full iron distance race. So this is the original Outlaw Half, and there were some big names racing. Yeah, that's right. Will Clark was on the start list. Phil Graves was on the start list. Uh, a number, and then in the women's side, there was Lucy Charles. Um, there were some really big names, basically, Bob, in that men's start list. Sadly, Will Clark pulled out the night before, yeah, last minute. He got sick overnight, didn't he? Yeah. And um, but still, it made for a cracking race, and it was taken out by Sam Pictor, Rob. 402 just ahead a minute ahead of Reese Barkley who finished in 40318 and then Lewis Eccleston Rob from Mantry you spoke to him didn't you after yeah, we Kona a while ago yeah didn't we yeah sprint finish between him and Reese wasn't it just down that finish line so Lewis managed to get third just pipping Phil Graves who came home what two and a half minutes later in fourth yeah, it looks like Phil really took it to everybody on the bike with a with a two eleven. It was the fastest bike split there, I think, by a clear four or five minutes. Um, interestingly, that he got outswum by Reese by a minute and a bit as well. So it looks like Reese and Lucy got out the water together in about twenty five minutes flat. Um, interesting. Amazing. Yeah, Matt Lehman um, led led out the water, didn't he? Who he finished in fifth in the end. Uh, yeah, just just ahead of Lucy Charles. So oh, that's as right, yeah, yeah. So you mentioned there, Lucy Charles. She took the win, a comfortable win, Rob, in uh, four nineteen. She didn't break the course record, which was set by Catherine Foe a couple of years ago, which I think shows two things. Number one, just how impressive Catherine Foe's race and result there was, and also, as I understand it, this was like a training race for. Lucy, but nothing to take away there from Cat Fo's result a couple of years ago. Um, so yeah, comfortable win, Rob. Um, Naomi Kira Wright was second in 4:45, and I know Naomi listens to the show as well. So Naomi, well done. And someone else is saying to me, "You've got to look out for her this year. You've got to look out for her this year. She's going to be amazing. She's going to light it all up." So congratulations yeah, there. And then, brilliantly. yeah, and then Rachel Hawker was third in 4:46. Especially impressive for Naomi because she wasn't racing as one of the uh, sort of an in inverted commas elite ladies was she either she's got a, a number in the thousands there so yeah that's right she so they had um, so elite next year they've got to have an they've got to have her as an elite haven't they now she's finished second <laughs> that's it we're calling it now a... naomi you're officially elite <laughs> get in we, there we get to decide this <laughs> They had an elite wave, Rob, and I think to get into it, you either had to finish in the top 10 there last year or have done, I think it was a sub five for the women. Right. Cool. Well, she's well under there then, isn't she? Yeah. Great. Exactly. Good stuff. Exactly. There we go. All right. And then over to the roasty, toasty, hot North Wales for the slate, man. It's not often we can say that, but the photos I've seen just look like it was completely stunning. Really beautiful weekend, both days. Um. It looked glorious, didn't it? Just looked amazing. Yeah, I love seeing That's the smiling funny. faces pop up on Facebook when people do that event, and it's no. ridiculously hard. 
<laughs> which I think makes the contrast even more hard and beautiful. It's fantastic, isn't it? Yeah, I'm sorry you didn't get to be there because it is just a wonderful, wonderful race. If if you've not done it, if you've seen it and you've seen pictures and you're thinking, oh yeah, I fancy that, get on it. It's a pedal cover slate, man. It is such a great race, and you get to you know walk through a little bit of sheep sheep poo on the way to the swim, don't you? Then you get to freeze. <laughs> in Lamberis and then you get to be battered on the bike by you know winds and normally rain and then you get to run up a slate mine I am selling it aren't I it's great it's a good event um all right if you call up the ladies event uh, ladies results uh, the men's race was taken out by Jack Hindle uh, Pete Dyson was in second and Bo Smith was in third um is there a way to fill the results here Hells, to women or we're we gonna have to go through it manually well, I'm going to tell you right now that um, we're doing we're doing standard, aren't we? Yeah, 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 yeah. So um, Susie Richards took the win. That I do know, Rob. Nice work, Susie. That's um, her race, I... isn't it? That's her patch. Oh, no one gets yeah. near Susie at Slate Man. No, she she did. Oh, she did brilliantly, and um, she took seven minutes, Rob, off of her course record. Oh, amazing. Which well, I think great. we're going to give her a nickname. We're going to call her the Slate Woman from now on. Susie the Slate Woman Richards. <laughs> <laughs> Slate Woman. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, okay. That works. Uh, Ruth Purbrook was second, Rob, who we've had on the show as well. Ruth actually did the Savage, so that is mighty fine. She finished in 250, uh, just ahead of Becky Schofield, who was third in 251. Good stuff. I tell you what, fair play to anybody who can race the race the sprint on the Saturday and then race the long distance on the Sunday. That's crazy. Ruth, crazy let us know stuff. how were the legs going up the second time, <laughs> 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 going up that glorious bit of yeah, yeah, love it. Oh, and Rob, we've got to give a shout out. Louise Minchin, uh, three forty eight. Yeah, I saw. Yeah, that was good. Great race, sixty-seven. Great racing for her. It's brilliant. Nice one, Louise. Nice one. Well done, Louise. Pop back in the archives and listen to that. Uh, listen to that interview if you've not heard that one already. All right. All that takes us over to this week's coaches' couch section. Yes, Rob. We've got a question in from Sean. He says, "Shall I go? You go. You go." That was, that was a good intake of breath there. Sorry, I was just breathing in. <laughs> he says i did the three hour race sim ride this weekend i held 90 percent ftp for nearly three hours with my heart rate in zone two i think my power might have increased do i need to do another ftp test <laughs> so sean's one of the guys in the team and i put this in here because i think it's going to illustrate a point that will affect a lot of people at this point in the year it's been a little while since Sean's done an FTP test. He's done a lot of hard training and his fitness is increasing rapidly, as we can see. And the fact that anybody can ride for 90% of FTP for three hours, that's that's an epic performance anyway. Yes, that in itself will suggest that you have got a lot more power available to you and it's time to test that and see <laughs> see where your, your FTP level is at. Um the other indicator here is that your heart rate was in zone two for almost all of this ride. And so these two things together point towards the fact that you've got much fitter on the bike. It is time, ideally, to do another test because we really want to get some accurate numbers around this. However, the other reason I wanted to do this section was to say, look, I know a lot of people don't enjoy testing. A lot of people can get extremely sort of mentally agitated around the test and it, it becomes almost a, a tail wagging a dog situation that people don't want to do the test because they think it's going to be really really painful and it is fairly full of discomfort you know so another thing a suggestion I've got for Sean here is to say look because you've ridden at 90% of FTP with your heart rate in zone two usually would expect an athlete to ride at about 75% of FTP for three hours with a heart rate in zone two. So it's likely there's that sort of 15% disparity there. Why don't we go ahead and stick 10% on your FTP just based on the numbers you had already? That'll give you a rough rule of thumb. And then you can psych yourself up to do an FTP test. But 
I guess my point is you don't always have to be out there testing because the training itself can be testing and can point you in the direction of the answer that you're looking for. So I think my, my first preferred option would be, yeah, do the test, get a validation and then know exactly what numbers you're riding to. But the second thing to say is you can always kind of get a feel for this just by what your numbers are telling you in training as well. Makes sense. Yeah. Good stuff. Yep. And Rob, you know, you mentioned there about the, some people don't like testing. Oh yeah. Takes me back to mental arithmetic tests at school. I used to hate them and, and I get the same feelings ahead of a, like a time trial on the bike. Yeah. 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 A lot of people do. I think it's a kind of, it's a performance anxiety thing or like in teaching, they used to have this phrase, is this assessment of learning or is it assessment for learning? And what they used to mean by that was assessment of learning is sit down and do this test and then I can get a number to tell me how clever you are. But assessment for learning is sort of identifying for the student what their strengths are and where they need to improve. And I think we can apply that to athletes as well. And especially if you're the kind of person who doesn't enjoy doing tests or time trials or races or whatever, we have to find another way that people can access accurate numbers to train off without kind of getting wound up and head up about it. It's mad, isn't it? I can remember really clearly when I used to do the, the sort of the, every 10th week we would do the CSS test in the pool um, mm. over winter at the club. And people would be going, will you tell me when the test is? Cause I'm just not going to come this week. Yeah. And, and the whole idea is it's not about what well, it shouldn't be about pushing yourself to the point where you feel sick it should be like a celebration of all the fitness that you've gained and if you're not a person who enjoys testing at the top end we need to find another way for you to sort of feel that you're progressing along the way I guess that's the important thing that people know that they're making progress and that's often hardest with athletes who've got a multi-year history because you know after two or three years in the sport you're at that point where you know I know hells my FTP is not going to get higher this year than it was the year before or the year before that it's just a question of can I get it back to the same level that it used to be and so the test kind of becomes about the same thing for me it's very hard to not approach it from a oh god I wonder how much less fit I am than I was at my peak performance level yeah it's it's like a fear of failure isn't it that's to me that's what it comes down to it's just a fear of failure and you kind of think yeah but in the grand scheme of things what does it matter but Oh, I used to honestly, Rob, in when I was like 10 or 11, I would genuinely go in and ask the teacher, please, can we not have a mental arithmetic test this Friday? Because I just used to get so worked up about it. I'd never, you know, it wasn't like I was really bad at it. I'd always do quite okay, But yeah, as always, I hated it. Maybe the thing we've got to develop is like the bigger picture is to have the resilience to sort of you know my process now is it's not about how fit I was in 2007 it's just about working out some accurate numbers go out and train that and make the most of the time I've got that's kind of what I try and tell myself yeah it's it's just a way to not waste the precious training time that you've got yeah and I think that's a very important thing to to flip it around isn't it and actually see it yeah definitely so Rob let's bring you some news but first of all why don't we do the interview with um, Richard Murray and Rachel Clammer and then after that we'll have some news and we've got a Chrissy Wellington signed book she's going to sign a book for us so we've got that to give away and we'll bring you details of that shortly but first of all here are the interviews of the week it's a double whammy with Richard Murray and Rachel Clammer Richard Murray hello and welcome to the Oxygen Addict Triathlon podcast how's it going? Yeah, yeah, it's going going great, going great. I'm a little bit tired, but uh, yeah, all, all in all, uh, everything's good on my side. How is your back? Because you uh, you didn't finish in Bermuda, did you? No, no, no. Yeah, I had a bit of a back issue, which I haven't had in you know <clears throat> in quite a few years. So since I was since I was a junior, uh, and yeah, it was interesting because I had my best swim of my career pretty much, <laughs> and uh, I thought, oh, this is a great, great, going to be a great day, and then. Uh, yeah, kind of, kind of went south from there, really. <laughs> and you know, when when it does go south in a race, and is it something that you sort of do you feel prepared for it ever, or is it always like oh, balls? Yeah, well, I think it's you know, it's kind of like uh, depends on what type it is, because you obviously have like the, you know, I've trained too much type, 
uh, where your body doesn't respond or something like that, and you you know you're like kind of hitting your head against the wall trying to get somewhere and you don't. Uh, and then you've obviously got the type where you say you crash out or something like that, and that's a different type of you know thing you've got to deal with. And uh, it's funny because this time it was uh, it was kind of like a high to a low. And yeah, I kind of had to just make the decision to to stop the event, which usually I don't like to do. I usually just like to go to the finishing line, uh, regardless. But uh, yeah, I think if something gets to the point where it starts, you know, could impact the rest of the season, then you kind of got to make a decision uh, during the race on on what you should do or what you you know what you shouldn't do. Is Yokohama your next next one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's that that is the next one, uh, which was a little bit concerning because I <laughs> planned to come back to the Netherlands for a week. Uh, and then go that direction so it's a lot of jet lag and travel and that stuff um but uh in hindsight i didn't really get to run all that much in uh, <laughs> in uh um in bermuda um so the legs aren't too too shattered which is which is one positive i guess uh, yeah i guess so how the hell how, how do you guys sort of deal with um jet lag and stuff because you're you're always on the move yeah yeah i mean it's uh you know, you kind of, after a couple of years, you know, you start to get to know the signals and the signs. And, you know, you're obviously waking up in the middle of the night and during the day you're tired for a couple of days. But, yeah, you need to play it by ear and obviously be careful and not overdo things. Um, and, yeah, I think it's all about just management, really. Um, and, yeah, it's the same, you know, it's the same every single time. You don't, you know, you don't disappear from jet lag. It's not like we're immune to it or anything <laughs> like that. Um, it's a superhuman. Uh, but... Uh, <laughs> No, definitely waking up uh, this morning as well. I was waking about, about 12, I went to bed at about 9.30. Yep. Uh, and I was destroyed at about 8 p.m. last night. And then this morning I woke up at about, I thought, oh, it's going to be about 3 o'clock. And I looked and it was 12 at 12 p.m. And I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> so, so, you know, I've had that for the last few nights. And uh, you kind of, you know, you just got to, every night it kind of goes a couple of hours later and eventually you wake up and uh, then you actually feel tired. So it's actually nice now because we were swimming early in the mornings. Um, here in, in the Netherlands so you know by the time swimming comes you know I'm, I'm ready ready and rearing to go because I've been away for four hours already so it's not all that bad <laughs> time to mentally prepare for it <laughs> <laughs> pretty much you know. do you now um, do you now enjoy swimming Richard um I do enjoy swimming now yeah I think it's you know the start swimming was like a well I would say it's less of a love-hate relationship now than it was at the start. Um, and yeah, I think it was, I had to kind of teach myself to enjoy it, which is difficult to do. But uh, I think that obviously the more you swim, uh, the more you, you know, I suppose you pick up on the skills or you pick up on the thing and you get stronger and then it becomes easier from there, I guess. Um, but it's definitely something you have to learn. It's not like, you know, you can go and do probably uh, say like, probably 20 30k in the pool every week and you could still suck which is quite depressing you know you think <laughs> you'd spend many many hours doing something you'd get better but unfortunately if your technique sucks then fortunately you're just going to pick up a shoulder injury probably <laughs> and getting any quicker <laughs> that's the thing though it is swimming it, it is like the bane of many age groupers lives in that we spend a long long time trying to improve trying to improve and you know for a lot of people who are busy working and everything like that we don't necessarily have the time to do 20, 20 or 30k in the pool every week and then it's just yeah it's just messy sometimes yeah i think you know that's the one thing where people get the i think the swimming side of it a bit wrong it's uh, i think technique is like you know it's one massive thing in swimming i think if you spent more time doing technique and actually less mileage swimming you'd probably be a better off swimmer um, just because your you know your feel of the water as they say is better and, and obviously, if you're doing something, it's like having the knowledge behind something, but not having the practical hours, I guess. I mean, even if you know how to do it, you're probably better off than having, you know, a couple of hours behind you. So you obviously know the basics and the fundamentals. And then you can do, you know, your cardio fitness can actually come from your cycling and your running a little bit. And, yeah, body position and things like catch and, and technique and those things are like, I think, probably like the, you know, the main core part of the swimming side of things. Who are you coached by at the moment? Um, I'm coached by two Dutch national coaches, uh, triathlon coaches. So one's Louis De La Haye. He also coaches a couple of professional road cyclists in the Netherlands and the Lotto Jumbo Cycling Team. He's the head coach of their team as well, so pro road cycling coach. Um, and then Jordi Mullenberg, he's, uh, he's also one of, the, one of the coaches here in the, national, uh, the Dutch national team uh, for triathlon. And he's the, he's the swim coach of your, so Louis does the biking and running side of things and then Together with Jordi uh, Mullenberg, our swimming coach. 
And how do you find that setup compared to um, someone like Joe Filio? It's you know it's a very different you know, environment, uh, and it's obviously you know there it was when I was with Joel was a lot more elite athletes, and uh, obviously they're all professionals, and none of them are studying and that type of thing. And since I've started training here with the, with, the, with the Dutch crew, um, yeah, I've noticed a lot more of them obviously studying things as well. Um, so the swimming's done like in sparrows fart you in the morning, which is uh, <laughs> quite tough, um, but uh, character building in, in, in another sense. Uh, and yeah, I think this, you know, it's quite different. We we have, obviously we have two rest days a week here, but in between the training, uh, we do, you know, three like very solid days, probably, you know, a tiny bit more than what I'm used to when I was coached by Joel. And then we have the break days. We actually have like bigger recovery on those days than I've, than I used to have with Joel. So it was, Kind of, we went more on a frequency side of things when I was when I was with my previous coach, and now it's more kind of just do with volume and, and less sessions, and obviously like, um, yeah, it's quite a different approach and, and 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 take it obviously coaching and triathlon. That is quite rare, isn't it, to have sort of two rest days or two I would say let's call them recovery days maybe. Yeah, yeah, I think it's uh, you know when you see the uh, kind of like a Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Um, you kind of look and go, oh, that's pretty, pretty massive. Um, <laughs> and you're like, oh, thank goodness Friday is coming along because <laughs> Saturday and Sunday is pretty gnarly as well. Um, so yeah, I think it's, and that's, on that aspect, it's, you know, we kind of, I still do the same, you know, duration. I still do the same amount of hours a week. So that stayed the same. Um, so probably anywhere from, uh, I get away on the on the leaner side of, of the hour side compared to most people. Uh, I probably do from anywhere from 20 to 30 hours a week, uh, probably 28 being like the high end of that. Um, and yeah, I think that's kind of how, and then the swimming pretty much from six days a week. Uh, biking's actually been picked up a bit more, um, well this year compared to other years, and then the running's kind of stayed similar, similar aspect really, or similar amount of duration. And are you enjoying biking again more because, like, biking and running, that it, you know, those two are your weapons, aren't they? Yeah, it is. It's funny, actually funny now. I mean, now that I'm biking so much more, I mean, I'm still, I still enjoy the biking, but it's starting to leave a, the biking and running starting to get quite similar now. And then the swimming's also coming, like, you know, it's picking up a little bit more. Um, I think it's kind of like a, you know, whenever you do well at something, then you kind of feel that that's your favourite. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think it's you know definitely uh, the running and cycling is still like that's what I love doing. Um, but yeah, the swimming is definitely picking up slowly, slowly, and that's kind of where you know where I want to be looking at as well anyway. So it's kind of you know the swimming is still priority. So let's go back to when you were a young lad and you you grew up on a farm, didn't you? Yeah, that's yeah, that's correct. I grew up on a farm just outside of uh, Cape Town, South Africa, about. 35 kilometers out from, from, from the center of Cape Town. And so how did you get into triathlon um, when when you were a youngster? Um, or duathlon? Yeah. <laughs> well, actually, yeah. I actually did my first triathlon when I was about 11 years old. Um, and that was just up the coast, just from where we stayed. It's so about 100 k's up the coast. It was like our, our provincial championships there. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I started to do... Um, mountain biking and uh, cross country running when I was in, in primary school, and uh, also did biathlon, uh, which is like run swim run in South Africa. And rather uh, than uh, skiing and shooting, yeah, yeah, I didn't. We don't have much snow in South Africa. Uh, we have a lot of shooting going on, but uh, not that not, the, not, not that type. Not the same type of shooting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, so that's kind of where it started. Uh, and then, you know, I had a cycling cycling coach for skills and that stuff when I was in primary school. So I learned like cycling skills and stuff when I was, you know, pretty young. Um, and I did motocross as well. So I did like extreme sports. Uh, my father was big into the, you know, off road scene of enduros and motorcycle racing and stuff. So uh, I grew up like racing a motorcycle around the farm like a maniac um, when I was like an early teenager. And yeah, so literally I was more in the off-road scene uh, than the road scene when I was back then on the farm because, well, we didn't have a tar road for about, so I think, three k's, three kilometers from my house. We didn't have a tar road. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so it was like a three, we had a three kilometer dead straight gravel road that got to the main road. And then that road was also like a secondary road in the farm. So it was quite, you know, taken away from the city. 
uh, but yeah, it was, I mean, it was a good, you know, chilled, like relaxed upbringing. Um, and you know, not too much, too much wildness going on in the farm. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. And then I think, you know, just being outdoorsy, you know, literally outdoors kids, we went, uh, apart from my, both my two brothers, they were like computer gamers. I was like the one outside, just, you know, spending too much time running around outside. Uh, and yeah, from there, literally started to do duathlon. Um, I got a, there was a, a German coach that was in, in Somerset West, which is only about 40 kilometers from Cape Town. Um, and there's a guest house there and he's a, what's it, he's a try, was a triathlon coach. And he told me, yeah, if you learn to swim, you can actually become a good triathlete. So I said, okay, well, maybe I'll give this triathlon a shot. Um, and he said, yeah, well, duathlon's like a dead sport. So no matter how good you get at it, you're not going to make much money. So I thought, oh, that's terrible because that's what I'm good at. Uh, and so, so I said, how long is it going to take me to get good at swimming? He said, oh, probably about five or six years. And I was like, Jesus. <laughs> so I thought, that's terrible. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, I went to Germany when I was a young, when I was in my early teens, I went to Europe by myself and checked the scene out. And I was like, wow, there's so many more people doing triathlon in Europe than there's in South Africa. Um, and so I thought, well, yeah, this has got like a future and stuff. And so, you know, I studied for, for two years after high school, uh, just for like a sports conditioning and, and coaching. Uh, so I just got a diploma from like a two year course after high school. And then I decided, okay, let me give this triathlon thing a shot. Um, and yeah, that was 2010. And then uh, my folks said, we'll give you two years um, to fund you for two years. And if you're not making that m enough money to support yourself, you've got to get a job. So I said, okay, deal. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, but also you also owe us the um, like 10 million rand that they paid or something for me growing up and it's like when when you make money you owe us all that shit back um, <laughs> have, you, have, have, you, have, you, have you given it back? Um, I've taken them on one or two holidays uh, during the year because they do a lot of they, they, do, they still help me a lot in, in sports and stuff and they do a lot of my admin side of things and things like that as well so uh, they come on a on a Richard paid holiday once a year. Nice. <laughs> Just, yeah, so where do you want to go this year? <laughs> I think that's a good deal. Yeah, so like, oh, come on, you want to go, if it's winter in South Africa and you can come to like Mallorca or you can come to, you know, Hamburg or something something like that. They they always end up coming to Hamburg. Do they, do they have to come and watch you race? Is this part of it? Like you'll pay for them it's and it's not really like... holiday, but... <laughs> no, no, they'll come for like two weeks or two or three weeks off to Europe or something like that. Uh, and they just yeah have a bit of a holiday, but uh, yeah, so they only come. They used to watch me quite often, but now they're getting get, getting on in, in in years. So they'll come like once, maybe yeah, usually once a year they'll come out to watch me race somewhere. Oh, which is your which is your sort of uh, most memorable race when they've been there as well? Uh, my most memorable race when they've been there. Yeah, I'm trying to probably uh, it's they haven't watched a hell of a lot of my international world triathlon events. Um, but they, they've been to, when I won duathlon world champs, uh, they were at both my duathlon when I was a junior. Um, they watched me win both of those. Um, and then, uh, which other, which other one I'm trying to remember now, actually, they haven't, they haven't been to all too many international races and stuff. Usually I don't do that great. <laughs> so, nah, but it's, uh. Yeah, no, I think they, yeah, a lot of the ones like Olympics and, and all of those events and stuff, usually I tell them, I don't know, it's, they've been in nice places, but there's been like, I say, hey, don't you want to come to this tropical resort instead? Because it seems like it might be far nicer than a, than a major city and they prefer the, the quieter environment. So. Did, did they come to Rio or, or London? Um, they came to London, um, but then with Rio, um, I kind of told them not to come and to come to Slovakia instead. The year after we, went, yep. we had a race in Slovakia and I was kind of like, cause I went to Rio and I thought, well, you know, it's nice, but I, I don't think, you know, they don't like the crowds and they don't like lots of people. And I kind of, and also they don't like the time zone changes either. <laughs> they like it to be a real holiday, you know, get there, like put the feet up and have no one around type of thing. So I thought, well, that's not really for you because it's like crowds and people and they don't like it. So I kind of told them, yeah, they don't need, they don't need to come at all. But <laughs> Tell me about uh, Challenge Samarin. How how was the adventure into longer racing? Did what what did you make of it? How did you prepare for it? Yeah, so that was like last year's wildness, where we literally hit off like I think I had like twenty three races last year, or twenty two races, which was like I think it was almost my record. I think I've done twenty five as my record. Um, 
but yeah so it was uh my folks came over to watch i told them you've got to come watch this i'm gonna really abuse myself and it might be entertaining to view um <laughs> so <laughs> okay cool they're gonna come and then they'll after that they'll they'll come to uh, the Bundesliga event, which they didn't end up coming to because they ended up going up on a on a boat. They went up the, I think they went up the Rhine, um, on like a on a cruise for like eight days or something like that. So they didn't end up coming to the Bundesliga anyway. But uh, <laughs> they, no, they, they they enjoyed being there in in, in Samoran and uh, yeah, it was a new country. You know, I always like going to a new country. Like you know, this year we went to Bermuda. Uh, I think Bermuda and Malta are the two countries that we're going to visit this year that we haven't been to. So I kind of like going to going to new countries where there's an event because it's like, oh, it's cool. I've never been there and maybe see the culture a little bit. So it's kind of kind of nice to do those too. But yeah, I think Samoran, uh, going back to it was, uh, I had like extremely high expectation of myself in the race and it kind of, I kind of didn't get to exactly where I wanted to be. And then I kind of realized that the guys I was racing against are like, they like they had the cream of the crop practically. Like, I don't know, I was just like, God, it's like multiple world champions in Kona and Ironman and stuff pitched up there. So you know, I can't be too hard on myself for my first event. Uh, but, uh, yeah, it was uh, – I'm going to say I, lit, I got bored, to tell the honest truth. Really? <laughs> I got re- – I was like, I'm out in the middle of nowhere, and there's no crowd, like nobody. <laughs> and then I'm looking in front, and Keenle and um, Lionel Sanders had put, like – eight minutes into me or something or seven minutes i was just looking at this road dead straight road with nobody and i thought this doesn't i feel like i'm like just abusing myself and there's nobody around to see this <laughs> <laughs> so yeah it was i don't know coming from like a high-paced uh, type of racing environment um to that type of environment it's like extre- extreme opposites i guess uh and uh my back, my, my lower back and my glutes literally got extremely painful at about 20, 20 or 30 Ks into the bike. I thought, oh, I've got another like 60 Ks of this. Um, so it was, you know, it was pretty, pretty tough. And I knew I'd lose time in the bike. And then on the run, I wanted to run like a 105 for the half marathon. That's what I like set out to train. Everyone said, like, you're crazy. You'll never run a 105. And I thought, no, I've got Project 105. That's what I'm going to do. Did <laughs> you got to run. I had to run like three tens per K or something, three oh eight, three oh three ten per K for like a half marathon, which is uh which is uh, Rapid. ballsy. Yeah. Quite ballsy. Uh but uh yeah, and then I ended up seeing that the running course was full of sand and grass and and everything other than a fast course pretty much. <laughs> which really kind of blew me to pieces because I was like, <laughs> Oh god, there goes my there goes my run completely out the window. Um so I think I still ran like a one fifteen, which is I don't think too bad. Uh, but yeah, I mean the last like five, the last four k or five k, uh, there was like no one ahead, like ahead of me for like three minutes, and there was no one behind me for three minutes. Going to decide, well, what's the point of me running hard here now? So I just kind of jogged it home. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think it was, you know, definitely something that I'd like to do if I'm more conditioned. Because I mean, I gave myself about two months. Yeah, two. I think about two months. Uh, to you know, to set myself up for the race. Yep. Um, which you know, a couple of guys have had you know a couple of years, so I'm a little bit behind on the year section there, which uh, could take some time. But uh, it was definitely a, an experience, and then also I raced like the weekend later. I raced a sprint distance Bundesliga race, which I could practice. I couldn't walk for about four days afterwards, so I thought this was going to be fun to try and do a sprint <laughs> without being at Rachel. Rachel and I were having to like go backwards down the stairs because they had like these three sets of stairs where they go down to the breakfast hall. And like both her and I looked like we had some type of like polio or some type of like thing with our legs. I was like, are you all right? So like, no, I don't think so. God, it's not just me that has to start walking downstairs backwards. That's, um... Yeah, it was, I was like, my quads were destroyed. <laughs> so would, would it be something that you would look to move into maybe after Tokyo, like more longer distance stuff again? Uh, yes and no. Uh, I've kind of got a funny feeling that Super League is going to grow pretty big uh, in the next four or five years. And I think it might be actually going, I don't know if the distances are going to go shorter. Like there's obviously still going to be like obviously half and full distance and then Kona. Uh, but I think the, you know, the majority, I don't know, I'm kind of seeing it as like more people can do uh, like say a 20 minute race than people can do an hour or two hour race for the, you know, the general, the general public. Um, so I think it might be heading that direction of, cause if you think about it, you go, Oh, can you swim 200 meters? And you go, yeah, I can swim 200 meters. Can you cycle six kilometers? Yeah, I can do that. 
and then maybe that'll you know bring a bigger crowd of people and you know can you cycle 100 it's very intimidating to somebody who you know thinks like 180 k's of cycling like even i think like 180 k's of cycling what the hell like, <laughs> just that is enough like by itself is enough pain <laughs> Let's alone putting like a marathon after that. They're like, are you insane? <laughs> so you go straight from there to like a doctor's appointment to check whether you're like medically still capable of like doing other things. But I think, you know, it's kind of funny though, because I mean, people in people love the challenge. That's kind of why, you know, it's like that drive of, you know, you don't think you can do it. And then, you know, once you've actually done it, you think, oh, that's amazing, you know couldn't believe I could actually do that, but it's all, they say, you know, a lot of it's got to do with ment- mental strength and mental ability and, and willing to do it. So you can, you can do it, but you might, you know, you might be wrecked for like two, three weeks afterwards. Uh, and then, yeah, so I think it's a, you know, a willing and wanting to do it, I guess, but I, I don't think, I'm not sure I'll go long when I get a bit older. I think, uh, yeah, I think I might actually be doing short or maybe going to, uh, something to do with marketing or something with coaching as well. I might want to start coaching. Uh, that's kind of what I'm, I've got a big passion to do with coaching. Um, so I think that's going to be more my line than going into into the longer distance, I think. Interesting, interesting. And you mentioned Super League there. How good was Hamilton Island? Yeah, that was that was very cool. You know, it was, uh, no one kind of knew what it would be like beforehand. And then uh, as soon as we heard that there were like all these live TV channels and all these things going on, I thought, man, this is this is really big. Like there's not many triathlons where they're like, we've got live viewing in like 10 different or eight different countries. <laughs> so it was, uh, you know, quite a big thing. And even though, even the world series races that we do, you know, they're live sometimes in the local countries if they want to, if they want to air them live, but it's very seldom that it is live. Um, so, you know, that goes a long way to obviously, you know, broadcasting the sport, you know, to the world, because if you know millions and millions of people viewing it, uh, that are, does big things for the sports and obviously for the sponsors and, and, and obviously our sponsors as well, my sponsors. Uh, so I think that's kind of, you know, why it's so cool. And obviously the environment that they make as well, you know, no one really knew who was going to win. So it's kind of, it changes the dynamic of the race. And I think I like the shorter swim as well. That definitely does me benefit. Um, you know, I'm, I'm only like five seconds or 10 seconds out of the water versus uh, 20, 30 seconds out. Uh, so that definitely helps me. <laughs> and how did you find the real sort of back-to-back nature of of racing? Because it was like, you know, racing for, I want to say like 20 minutes, and then you'd have that 10-minute break, wouldn't you? And then you'd be going again. Yeah, I think it was like doing a track session type of thing, you know, except for you have longer time, so you have like more time for the lactic to build up. Um, so obviously I think it got to do with how well you're, how fit you are, is the quicker you recovered between the rounds. Uh, so if you're unfit, obviously you don't recover as fast and then the next round comes and you're not ready, whereas other people might be a little bit more ready. Um, and yeah, so it was definitely, you know, and it was like extremely hot there. It was like Singapore type weather almost. So uh, it was really, really tough. And uh, I think, you know, uh, all the rounds and all the things, and there were so many different things that, you know, like different rules or different uh, how to win the events and those things, it was pretty complicated. So. But it was pretty good. It was great fun, and uh, yeah, I think everyone had a pretty good time there. So it was quite a, quite enjoyable, and it was like also you know in in March side. I think it was in March. Yeah, March side last year. It was quite like you know a, well, I wouldn't say a bit of a dangerous race to do, but uh, to do it at that time um, of the season can obviously could make or break your season. So you kind of got to choose choose wisely to do which obviously events you take part in. And you came away with a nice paycheck as well. Yeah, yeah, it was like practically. Uh, well, not practically. It was my biggest paycheck of, of my career, um, which is which is super cool. And uh, I think it's usually what I'm making into the whole season. So it was like one race, one race made my whole season's earnings, <laughs> which is pretty sweet. Um, yeah, and I think that year also got this. I think I uh, got the Island House win as well. Is it last? No, it wasn't. No, it wasn't last year. It was the year before. It was the year before yeah. the Island House. But uh, that's also. Um, I heard that's not that's not going to happen apparently at the end of this year the Island House races I don't think it's going to be on the end of this year which is quite sad because it's a pretty pretty awesome place to go I think oh no really that is probably the coolest place to race like a can I mean if you try and race on like a private island where there's like no cars involved and there's one little cafe there and one restaurant 
and like five cabanas, then I don't know, it's difficult to beat something like that. Oh, that is. When, you know, when you, when you get the invite for something like Island House, are so you just like, oh, get in? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's weird now. That's then you're already like, you would go there because I mean, uh, last year I went there like <laughs> pretty unfit. I'd been like sick for three weeks. Uh, and then I had like two weeks of training and I thought, okay, I'm going to go there with like 50% power, which is not going to be good. And uh, there was prize money up at all. So five people lost that in prize money, I think, because there were only 15 people. Yeah. And I was like, at one stage, I was like the 10th place with Mont. Me and Mario were vying for 10th place. And I was like, oh man, there's like $10,000 between 10th place and 11th place. Nice. So it was, yeah, it was pretty wild, but... It's still good fun, and to go there in itself is like a, you know, it's a privilege just to go there. So it's pretty cool. And so, will you be doing Super League again this? Sh- well, I guess it starts, isn't it? It starts later this year. So Jersey starts in September, doesn't it? And then through yeah, to like next Jersey, March. Jersey, then Malta, and then Barcelona. Oh, in yeah, the like Jersey, yeah, and then it ends in Mallorca on the last one. So will that be on your radar? Yeah, that's definitely yeah, yeah. It's going to be a long. It's going to be a long ass season, to tell the truth. But uh, yeah, we're going to Australia, and then I come back to Europe for two of the races, and then I think I might go home for like a little bit, seeing that I've been going to be gone about seven seven months this year from South Africa, which is uh, quite a long stint. Um, and yeah, and then I'll come back for those for obviously those those last races of the season. It's a long old season, isn't it? Do you, are, you get, are you able to play a little bit of golf in between training, Richard? I don't really get much time. <laughs> no, I don't. Eh? I mean, I enjoy it when I can play. It's usually off-season uh, is when I get to play some golf. So all these courses, when you're travelling around the world and you see all these beautiful courses and you're thinking, oh, yeah, I'd quite like a game on there, but you can't do it. Nah, nah. If I had to carry more luggage with me, I'd be in big trouble because I'm already at like 60 kilos of luggage around the world. So, <laughs> yeah, i got to make sure I don't have too much more. Yeah, true. Um, Richard, I, it would be bad if I, if I didn't ask. Um, do, do you regret sort of what happened back in Hamburg in 2016? Um, no, I actually don't because I picked up my... Well, I didn't say I pick up my manager from Hamburg, but... Uh, I kind of did pick up my manager from Hamburg. So, uh, no, nah, I think it's, you know, it's one of those learning curve things. It's kind of like, I don't know, in, in your career, you have to learn what, you know, the good, the bad, the ugly, you know, you name it. Uh, so obviously that one was to learn to not lose my cool <laughs> because, uh, you know, obviously as a professional athlete, you know, that's, you need to be, you know, just that you need to be professional. Uh, so, you know, that was one thing I had to, you know, I had to learn and it was, it's quite funny. Most people don't really know the whole, the whole circumstance to to what actually happened behind the behind the scenes. Um, and uh, I got a penalty like the year before for having a water bottle sit next to my bike stand. So before the race, we were setting transition up and then put my water bottle down next to my bike, and they called me for an interview. And uh, I did my setup, and I, I forgot this water bottle just sitting there on the side of the on the side of the thing. And they gave me a penalty for my water bottle just sitting there the whole race. It didn't. It just like sat there by my bike stand. And they gave me a penalty for that. And I was like, I can't believe they would give me a penalty for something so minuscule like that. But they have this rule and they like to follow the rules. So, And then the year after, um, the same thing happened. I got asked for an interview in transition and I put my helmet on the wrong side of my bicycle. So it, it was actually in front of the box of the athlete that was on my right. Um, and I went for an interview and I came back and I – you know, my helmet was on the wrong side of my bike. So when I ran to my bike, my bike out the water, I actually put my wetsuit in the box of the guy that was next to me, so not my box. And then I got a penalty from that. So it's like Hamburg is just, I've had a couple of, you know, problems there. And uh, I was I was on the run. And then uh, Mario was running me, he was next to me and he said, Richard, you have a penalty. While we were running and we were like 20 seconds up from the field. And I was like, is he trying to screw with me now or is this now is he trying to get to me or something like in my brain and then we ran past and i saw that there was i was on the board and i was like shit so i stopped and i was shouting at this official to, to try and to try and get the information as to why i had a penalty from the official and the pen the, the official didn't even look at me he just like kept staring at his watch and i was like getting more and more aggravated shouting at this official I'm like, come on, tell me what it's for. Tell me what it's for. And then, like when I like when I left the penalty box, I just got a lamp pissed off, and I just obviously throw the up your sign. 
but I was actually throwing the upyours up to kind of the like kind of the general like oh, kind of the event something not at the official and they saw it as throwing it at the official um, so I was kind of just angry in general um, and then yeah afterwards I kind of lost my cool and stuff and then they kind of gave me a gave me a rap on the knuckles and lost all the prize money and all the points and all the stuff and so it was a bit of a a bit of a cock up but uh, as uh, as as things happen sometimes you know good things happen bad things happen and that was one of those bad things life would be boring if we were all the same though wouldn't it yeah if everything was perfect people would uh, pack up and go home and wouldn't watch so <laughs> if I added a little bit of excitement to the race and that's good <laughs> Exactly. Now, Richard, um, I would love to carry on chatting, but I'm going to leave it there because I'm going to speak to your lovely girlfriend shortly, uh, Rachel. So thank you so, so much for your time and best of luck for the rest of the season. Perfect. No, thank you very much. It was great chatting to you. And yeah, thank you. Uh, I'll put you over to Rachel. Rachel Clammer, hello and welcome to the Oxygen Addict Triathlon podcast. How are you? Good. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Today was kind of a busy day, um, so we're at a national training centre currently where they like to swim early. Well, early for me, early for Richard. <laughs> we're not, maybe we're not really morning people. Uh, we swim at seven, and then afterwards, I actually did have a nap for the first time in a long time because I was really tired. <laughs> then after that, we went for a ride. I, we did some bike skills, so there's. A uh, guy here who yeah teaches us how to ride a bike properly, and after that I went for a long run with my coach, and I hope I made him tired enough, and then yeah made dinner and now we're here. I'm nearly ready for bed. And um, what um, yeah seven seven a.m. early for you guys is that early I for know, swimming? Yeah. I know it's it's not early for a lot of people, but we're not really used to it. Um, I think we also like to eat quite late and like to train quite late. So we literally just finished dinner. I think Richard will actually still have some more dinner and it's already almost 8.30. Um, so, yeah, <laughs> I think that's the problem too, that we don't really like going to bed really early and then waking up at 7 then feels really early. Or at 6, waking up at 6, not waking up at 7. <laughs> When I spoke to uh, David McNamee, he says that he's now based in Girona in Spain mm -hmm. and he was saying there is brilliant because a bit like you, he prefers getting up a little bit later in the day oh. and, you know, his first swim session might be, I'm sure he says something like 9am and so actually yeah. when he's finished his training in Spain, obviously it's very normal to go out in the evening and he can still go out and be sociable at like 10pm and it doesn't matter. No, exactly. I think I would like that type of life too. Um, that's honestly what I do at home. Uh, I think a lot of Dutch people like to have dinner early too. Like we're living with some other athletes in the same house and some people have dinner like at 5.30 and then I'm like, well, I'm still going out for a run. And then when we get back, we can shower, start to make dinner, have dinner around 8.30. <laughs> so yeah, I think everyone just likes different things. Correct. Tell me, Abu Dhabi, how the hell was that, getting your first um, WTS win? Yeah, that was really good. Um, I'm not sure. I didn't expect it yet. I mean, my goal was top five WTS. And um, I mean, I spoke to a lot of people about it and like my boyfriend and my coach and even my manager. And then my manager said, OK, like um, podium or something. He said something like podium today. I was like, oh, well, if not today, hopefully another time. He's like, no, today. So when I crossed the finish line, I was like, oh, my manager should tell me this more often. So, no, it was really good. And, yeah, really happy to get closer to that goal. What was that course like? Because everyone was dropping like flies on the bike, weren't they? Yeah, um, I actually don't know. I didn't, I didn't really have issues on the bike there. Uh, yeah, I mean, it was raining, it was slippery, I mean, it's on a F1 track, um, so even on the course familiarization, people went down. Maybe I was also lucky that the months before, I didn't do any cornering. It sounds weird that I was lucky, but I really took it really, really, I wouldn't say easy, but I didn't take a risk at all during that ride. I mean, I saw my coach every lap and every lap I was like, oh man, I'm so scared. <laughs> so 
So, yeah, maybe that was a good thing, actually, that I didn't have the confidence to go through those corners very hard. So the skills that you were working on today, does that involve things like cornering? <laughs> yeah, definitely cornering. We did a lot of corners today and we'll do the same thing tomorrow again. Yeah. And then like descending and, and things like that. So hills yeah. and yeah, descending. Yeah, it's, it's really nice. They've got a nice uh, park here, which is just for bicycles. They made it only like last year. It's called the Tom Dumoulin Bike Park. And they've got, uh, they made a hill in it. They've got a big loop, which is, just over 1k, I think. Um, they've got some corners and a hill where you can take a couple of downhills, cobbles, no cobbles, bricks. So it's actually a really nice place. That sounds so Dutch, but so cool. <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah, I don't know if it's really Dutch. I should actually ask Richard, but yeah, no, I don't think so. That the bike park, it's, it's just really nice. It's good for at least to train for, to train for, with, for their skills and stuff. How much of your training do you and Richard do together? Um, we used to do basically everything together. But since we've joined our new coach, we actually have different programs more often. Um, so I think, like today, we only really swam together. I mean, we did the bike skill session together, more or less. I mean, we were in the same group, but less training together, which is... I mean, I really enjoy training with him, but it's also sometimes nice to just see each other at the end of the day. Hey, what did you do today? And not like, oh, yeah, I did literally exactly the same thing as you did today. Same training, same food, same people. Um, so it's kind of nice to not always train together. But I did realize the first time I went to a training camp without him this year, I mean, it was the first time in like five years almost, I, kind of, I missed him because I was not used to train with other people or train by myself I could always compare my pace to Richard like I knew that if he likes to run really slow I should say that first but if I would run much faster in training than him on the easy sessions I would I would know I'm in a pretty good shape um, and if I don't I know okay today's not such a great day so it's yeah it's kind of fun how you get used to train with the same person did it um, did you find it difficult sometimes though with, with your relationship in that like you said you would be literally doing everything and sometimes you just need a bit of space don't you from the person yeah I, I, I'm sure everyone needs some personal space yeah, um, yeah well I don't know it's, it's, it, it's of course really nice that you're both doing the same thing um, you understand like if someone, someone says okay I have to go and train like you don't need to explain why you, why you do that um, like the traveling together and everything, do, like the traveling, going to races together. I mean, you always have someone you know. It's, it's like, yeah, you, I used to miss home for it a lot when before I met Richard, and now I realize I haven't been. I have been at home for three weeks since half November. So, yeah, you, you forget about certain things. So it's it's really nice, but also really nice to. Yeah, be yourself. The one thing I told my coach for the first time is, okay, we're both gonna train with you. You're both, you're gonna be our coach. But I, he, it's Richard and it's Rachel and it's not the girlfriend and boyfriend. Like I don't need to do the same thing if it's not good for me. Uh, so it was really important to, yeah, talk to the coach about this. And am I right in saying you two met um, doing drugs testing? <laughs> yeah, we did. How romantic! Oh yeah, very romantic. It was um, I was in Cape Town World Cup actually, and Richard tried to show his urine to me. I think he tried to do that as a joke. Uh, I wasn't too impressed actually. <laughs> <laughs> did Did you take a little bit of convincing? No, I don't know. I think he had to work for it for quite a while. I wasn't I wasn't convinced immediately. <laughs> <laughs> um um <laughs> and. What was you know when you were in in um, in Abu Dhabi? Yeah. What was his reaction like? Oh, I, I don't. I haven't seen him as excited at, as that moment. Um, often, I'm all, not always sure if he's there when I'm racing. But well, if he still has to race, he's not there. I mean, that's if he if he's racing first, I'm not gonna be there. But whoever races first is going to be at the race uh, from the next person. Well, that's my, that's kind of my law. I'm not sure if he likes it, but <laughs> so I, when, when I was running on the last 
lap. I saw him like riding his bike and shouting, and I was like, okay, someone is here, someone is happy. So yeah, very happy. And did you? He said um, when we spoke to him, he said that when he did a uh, challenge um, in Slovakia last year, mm. he got bored. How yeah. did you find it? I didn't get bored. <laughs> I think that's a big difference. He loves the speed and the short races and high intensity. And I don't know, I really enjoyed it. I have to say for me it was slightly different too because, for example, I'd never I'd never been on a TT bike before. So two weeks before the race, I got my first TT bike. I didn't do a bike uh, like set up. We just, well, Richard helped me with it. So it wasn't perfect yet because... Oh, maybe the bike was a little bit too big and so I went there um, without real expectations just hoping I would survive the race and go as fast as I can but I didn't have a power meter on my bike I'd, I tried with a heart rate belt on but I'd never really used a heart rate belt on the bike so it was just more like trial and error and I mean the bike was really hard um I couldn't pace myself. I wasn't used to riding that pace or especially not without a power meter. Like if I had a power meter on that bike, I would have been like, okay, stick to that stick to that wattage and just continue doing lifts. But I didn't. So it was, it was for me, it was really a challenge. What, how did you find the run, running off the bike and, you know, doing a, a half marathon? Uh, it was actually really good. Uh, I was surprised myself well, and everyone else probably. I think I had the fastest running time there. Um, so it was, I think it was my third half marathon ever. I did one in the start of 2013 and then not again after that. So a couple of weeks before the uh, half distance, I decided, okay, maybe I should run another half marathon. So I choose one, like a local, local race. Um, did a half marathon, but just... You know, not not really hard, but just harder than you would do in training. Uh, so it was I was a bit scared that I would get cramp or I wouldn't make the finish line because it was so long. Uh, but I was completely fine until I finished. <laughs> <laughs> then what happened? Oh, I could barely. I mean, I don't know why they do that, but they make the finish line always a little bit higher, I think. So I stopped and then I had to walk down and I could barely walk down. I sat down and I was like, oh, my parents were there. And I was like, oh, I think I can't walk anymore. But that, that's probably just, that's probably more from the bike than from the run. <laughs> and so, you know, like normally now this season, obviously a lot is the World Triathlon Series. You probably don't do much on your TT bike now again. No, uh, nothing. Um, like is it gathering year, dust? It yes it actually is i haven't touched it since um so that's it that has been a while now like last year we did a lot of different races i did my first xterra i did the half distance race i did bundesliga racing wts european cups i i just raced a lot like i think there was one time where i did like six races in seven weeks or five races in six weeks it was it was just crazy but I felt like this is the year where I can just do that and figure out what do I like, what do I, just just doing whatever I felt like doing. Um, although this year, uh, with the new coach, we, uh, well, I decided that this year had to be a bit more serious and I wanted to focus on the WTS series. And do you think you will mix it up again come, you know, after Tokyo? Who knows? I'm, I'm not sure. Um, I mean, it's it's funny how quickly four years go. Um, yeah, into, how, honestly, into, how do we already get to 2018? <laughs> I'm scared by this. Yeah, <laughs> it's just crazy. In 2012, um, one, and I started doing triathlon in 2008, 2009. Within a couple of years, I was in the Olympics in 2012. Then I struggled a bit and I was like, well, I'm not sure if I'm going to continue. Then suddenly I was there in 2016 and at the finish line, my parents were there too. I was like, dead. I'm not even going to think about it. I'm I'm going to do another four years. I want to go to the Olympics again. Um, so it's I kind of live every four years. I just decide, okay, now it's going to be until 2.20. And then afterwards, I'll see. Maybe I'll cross that finish line again. I'll be like, oh, I want to do another four years. Or maybe something else will happen and I'll decide to do long distance. Or yeah, I don't know yet. No, don't need to think about it yet. No, exactly. I'll just I'll just live every day and see what happens. So, Flora Duffy, 
what the heck? How how are you guys gonna gonna beat her? She is on fire. Yeah, it is. I I'm not sure if it's my task to do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, of course, everyone wants to beat her. Everyone wants to beat each other anyway. Um, she's very strong. Um, um, I think I'm still learning. I've made a lot of steps, and I think slowly I'm getting there, but still, still not exactly there. I make some mistakes. Get, get like last weekend, I got a, I wanted to get on my bike, made some mistakes, and the front pack is just riding away from me. And like, you can't make mistakes like that if you want to be the best in the world. And so, yeah, first I think I have to work on those little things, and then think about the big picture. What was the atmosphere like in Bermuda in that race? Because you know she was way out in in front ahead of ahead of everyone, but in her home country and in the lead. So what was it like for yeah. the rest of you? It must have been amazing for her. I mean, I had the grand final in Rotterdam last year, and it's so nice to have people you know watching your race and cheering for you. Um, again, uh, too bad I was a couple of minutes behind. <laughs> Um, in a pack where I didn't notice much of everything. I mean, went on the last lap. I can laugh about it now, but I was very frustrated the whole race, so I didn't notice too much. Um, on the last lap, I saw everyone walking down the hill already, and I was like, oh, that's nice. I still have a couple of K left. Um, so it must have been really nice for her, her not too much for me. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned earlier that last season you did loads and loads of races. Yeah. How do you recover between races if you're doing that many that often? Yeah, I think the, the funny thing is if you do a lot of races and you, you just use them as a heart training session, so in between you don't do much, you do some recovery sessions and that's it. Um, but it's only after a couple of weeks that you start to notice you're not as fit because you don't do long rides, no long runs, no long swims. So you can do it for a couple of weeks. But then after that, you'll get it. You'll get some problems. Um, you you don't do your core stability, your strength work. Um, so it will go very well for a couple of weeks because you've got some really good hard sessions done, but you're missing. You just get a lack of endurance. And do you do a lot of core stability and, and strength work? How often are you in the gym? Uh, lately, yeah. not too much. <laughs> That's really important I've been talking about with my coach and the last couple of weeks we've been working on that. Um, before Rio, I li- did a lot of gym, like, well, a lot. At least three times a week I would go to the gym and do stuff, of course, especially core stability. Not, I'm not a big fan of heavy weights. Um, so, yeah, I did a lot of that. But then last year when you just start to travel a lot and – if you're tired, the first thing you skip is your gym session because, yeah, you always have the feeling it's not that important. Um, so it's it's really a point we are, yeah, we want to and we are currently working on. And Rachel, what do you do away from triathlon? How, how do you relax? What are your other loves in life other than Richard and triathlon? Well, a tough question. I'm too honest. The last couple of months have been really, really busy. Um it's hard to, especially to people who don't uh, do a lot of sports or who just like to go to the gym a couple of times a week. They're like, what else do you do? I mean, it's just like swimming, biking, and running, and what do you do with your spare time? I'm like, well, like, I could just show you what, uh, what I do during the week. Like, yesterday I had a photo shoot from 12 to 6. And I was like, well, that's, that's already six hours. Before that, I woke up at six and quickly managed to do two or three training sessions and beforehand. And I mean, you're basically your own little business. So with finance, sponsor stuff and yeah. So it goes with ups and downs. In off season, I mean, I like to go for a nice holiday. And I mean, I think Richard likes to chill on the beach a bit more, but I like to stay active. So we struggle with that a little bit. <laughs> um, so yeah, I really like to be active, and which is also maybe my problem that if I don't have to train for a day or two or around racing I get yeah I get like nervous I'm like come on I, I have to move I have to do some exercising but I used to love to draw and be out in the nature and lucky enough what I love doing is what I have to do so that's a good thing that's pretty helpful isn't it like uh-huh. if you were if you were stuck in an office I guess you yeah. would go insane 
Exactly. I, I've been thinking about that too. It's like, well, what happens if I have to work in an office? It's like, that, oh, no, 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 that's not going to happen. At least not till 2.20 and not <laughs> after that because I first have to find a job. So, Yeah, av- avoid it for as long as possible. Exactly. I will for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Rachel, thank you so much. It's been great to have a chat. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank and, you too. And uh, best of luck for the rest of the season. And we look Thanks. forward to following your progress. Rob, busy triathlete, you see, doing everything at once. I, I think she might have been doing the washing up or someone was doing the washing up in the background. Yeah, There's definitely a bit of something going on, <laughs> wasn't there? <laughs> <laughs> Definite atmospheric, but no, really, really good of uh, Rachel and Richard to come on the show. And I, I do love the fact that they met in the um, doping control tent, Rob. Their eyes met across a plastic beaker <laughs> of urine. How romantic! <laughs> nah, brilliant, brilliant stuff. So, yeah, thank you very much, and uh, good luck to them both for the rest of the season. Yes, indeed. All right, a bit of news for you. First up, um, junior superstar. Alex Yi has gone and recorded 27.51 for uh, for 10k. <laughs> Mad, for, isn't it? for a triathlete to be a couple of seconds outside the British under 23. He's still got three years to go. He's only 20 to be three uh, yes. five seconds outside that. That's brilliant. He's he's such a talent. And Rob, for the who, future. who? And Rob, whose record is that? The British under 23 record. Dave Bedford. Yeah, <laughs> tells you everything. The man, the myth, the mustache. That's amazing, isn't it? It is incredible. And the fact that he had such a dreadful crash last year and he so spent a lot of that time out, didn't he? Yeah. So, oh, well done, Alex. Phenomenal. Top stuff, phenomenal mate. Phenomenal running. So, yeah. And another bit of news. We've got Ironman Cork and it has officially been announced, hasn't it, over in, over in Ireland? Yep, that's right. So it's going to be coming next year, June the 23rd in 2019. General registration is going to open on June the 5th of this year. And Rob, it it sounds very lovely. It sounds such a beautiful part of the world. Have you been down to that? Spent a lot of time down that way, yeah. Have you? Spent a lot of summers as a windsurfer living in my car on the beach over that way. Yeah, so beautiful i think you can look forward to a an ironman wales type experience where there's going to be constantly rolling roads and four seasons in one day in terms of weather but stunning scenery thought. amazing amazing people there and i'm sure it's going to be a fantastic event look forward to learning more about that definitely right tell us about uh the chrissy book giveaway hells yeah, fine. So we are over the next, so this episode and the next episode, uh, we're going to open this one up and we have a copy of Chrissy's book to give away to the finish line. And this is going to go, we, we want to know, and Chrissy wants to know as well, the best piece of triathlon advice and the worst piece of triathlon advice you've ever been given. And then Chrissy will send a personalised signed book to the winner. Uh, you have until midnight on Sunday, June the 3rd to get this in. All right, cool stuff. And where do they send their entries into, Hells? Shall we say to email into helen at auctionaddict.com? Good stuff. And one last thing, remember to send in your nominations for the Tribe Triathlete of the Month Award. You can send those to helen at com as well. You've got until the 25th of this month to send in your nominations and we'll make the announcement in the week's following show. Good stuff. Well, I think we've got time to just wrap it up there, Hells. I think so. That sounds good, Rob. Um, happy, happy week and uh, we'll catch up again next week. Yeah, good. Thanks for listening, everybody. I'm Coach Rob Wilby. I'm Helen Murray. And tune in again next week. We'll look forward to checking you there. Remember, you can use the code OxygenAddict to get £9.99 worth free from precisionhydration.com. All right, everyone, speak to you again soon. See ya.